What is going on guys? Evan Preco here. You are watching the SG1 Sports Big Ten Football Channel. We are going to recap all the games that took place for week 9 in this video. And to start things off, we've got number 13 Wisconsin at number 3 Ohio State. And Ohio State blew out Wisconsin 38-7 in this game. And for their stats for the Buckeyes, Justin Fields went 12 of 22 for 167 yards, 2 touchdowns, no interceptions. He also had 28 yards rushing and a touchdown on the ground. J.K. Dobbins had himself a day. He had 20 carries for 163 yards, averaging eight, over 8 yards a carry and a touchdown run. Chris Olave was their leading receiver. He had 7 receptions for 93 yards and 2 touchdown catches. Ohio State ran the ball for 264 yards, and they had 431 total yards of offense against that Badgers defense. For the Badgers, Jack Cohen went 10 of 17, only 108 yards, 1 touchdown, no interceptions. Jonathan Taylor was once again their leading rusher. He had 20 carries for only 52 yards, averaging 2.5 yards a carry, no score. Quintez Cephas was their leading receiver. He had 3 receptions for 57 yards, averaging 19 yards a catch exactly, no touchdowns. Wisconsin only ran the ball for 83 yards, and they had only 191 total yards of offense and 2 turnovers. And for this game, it started out very, very slow, very low scoring uh, throughout most of the first half. Uh, Ohio State scored a touchdown to make it 10 nothing right before halftime, and that would be the score going into halftime. And then Wisconsin came out uh, and scored right away on their first drive to make it 10-7. to And then Ohio State uh, scored with a Justin Fields touchdown run to make it 17-7 with about 9.5 to go in the third. And they scored again with a J.K. Dobbins touchdown with six and a half to go in the third to make it 24-7. So basically, up until about halfway through the third quarter, this was a game. This was a game. Um, and then Ohio State, they really adjusted well at halftime, and they just blew the game open um, for the rest of the third quarter and the fourth quarter, and they ended up winning the game 38-7. to And one thing that surprised me was how good of a game J.K. Dobbins has. Now, obviously, he's one of the best running backs in the country. I personally thought that Jonathan Taylor was the best running back in the country. He won the Doak Walker Award last year, and I originally thought he was going to win it again this year, possibly the Heisman. But um, in my opinion, coming into this game, in my opinion, Wisconsin had a better defense than Ohio State, and I thought that Jonathan Taylor was a better running back than J.K. Dobbins. And for J.K. Dobbins to basically get over 100 more yards than Jonathan Taylor had in the same amount of carries. They both had 20 carries. Um, for J.K. Dobbins to get 111 yards more than Jonathan Taylor had, and he scored against what I thought was a better defense, I think J.K. Dobbins might be one of the best running backs in the country. Even though he is one of the best running backs in the country. I think he might be the best running back in the country. I really think so. He has... I don't want to say carried this offense, but he has done such a great job this season so far. He has been so dominant in his running, his cutbacks, his strength, and he gets into the end zone a lot. And I think he's been Ohio State's leading rusher almost every game this season, if not every game this season. So he's having a fantastic game, and I'm kind of surprised that Justin Fields is in the Heisman race over him, especially because for Fields, yes, he's a great player, he's having a great season, but he has not thrown for a lot of yards, and his completion percentage is not the best. That's personally why I don't think he should be in the Heisman talk, but we'll see what happens throughout the rest of the season. Um, but as far as this game, you know, Ohio State, I did not expect this to be as big of a game for them as it was. I thought it was going to be a lot closer, um, but they really, really proved themselves on Saturday, and I personally think that they should be ranked number one. I think that they are the best team in the country because you look at the teams they've beaten – and how big of a margin uh, the wins have been for them. I mean, it doesn't compare to anyone else. It, it I, I wouldn't even think that it compares to LSU. And LSU has some has beaten some good teams or some teams that we thought were really good at the time. And but the games were a lot closer in my it, they were a lot closer. So I think that Ohio State is the best team in the country, um, and they've got some exciting games to finish the season. Next week they're going to play Maryland, and that should be a blowout. And then they've got Rutgers after that. So they've got two easy games, and then they have to play Penn State and Michigan. And that's how they end their season. So two gut-checking games for them to end their season, and we'll see how they do with that. Uh, for Wisconsin, boy, this just does not look good for them. They're now 6-2. and two. They're 3-2 and two in 
conference play. They've dropped in the rankings from number six to number 18 in two weeks. Um, so their their playoff hopes are out the window, in my opinion. Um, they can still win the Big Ten West. They, they, they must win out. They must win out. If they lose to Iowa next weekend, their Big Ten title hopes are gone. They must win out, and uh, they need Minnesota to lose to Penn State or any other game, basically. And I think Penn State's the best chance for that to happen. So they need to win out, and they need Minnesota to lose to Penn State if they want to win uh, the West. And if that happens, they will win the West. So uh, we'll see how that ends up working out for them. But yeah, great win for Ohio State. It's looking tough for Wisconsin. They're two games behind Minnesota now in the West, and we'll see what ends up happening with them. Next up, we've got number 20, Iowa, versus Northwestern. In the final score of this game, Iowa shut out Northwestern 20 to nothing. And for the Hawkeyes, uh, Nate Stanley went 12 of 26 for 179 yards, a touchdown pass, no interceptions. Tyler Goodson was their leading rusher. He had 11 carries for 58 yards, averaging 5.3 yards a carry, no score. And Tyrone Tracy Jr. was their leading receiver. He had two receptions for 88 yards, averaging 44 yards a catch and a touchdown. Iowa ran the ball for only 123 uh, rushing yards, and they had 302 total yards of offense. For Northwestern, Aiden Smith went 18 of 32 for only 138 yards, no touchdowns, and a pick. Isaiah Bowser was their leading rusher. He had 14 carries for only 36 yards, averaging 2.5 yards a carry, no score. And Ramad Chiakiao Bowman was their leading receiver. He had four receptions for 41 yards, averaging 10.3 yards a catch, no scores. Uh, Northwestern only had 64 rushing yards, and they only had 202 total yards of offense and a turnover. Um, this is kind of what I expected. We all know Northwestern is not a good football team this year, and Iowa is a contender for the Big Ten West, so we all knew that this was going to be uh, quite a bit of a blowout. I thought that Iowa would be able to score more points, uh, if I'm going to be completely honest. I mean, this Northwestern defense isn't anything special. Um, they've had their moments. They held Nebraska to 13 points, um, and that lost to them. So they've, you know... Looked decent at times, but I definitely expected Iowa to score more points on them. So offensively, uh, Iowa still has some stuff that they need to figure out, especially because they're going to be playing Wisconsin in Madison next week. And we all know Wisconsin has a pretty good defense. So um, they're going to really need to have a good week of practice offensively if they want to win that game. Um, but as far as Iowa goes, you know, next week, that's going to be a big game against the Badgers. And then after that, they play Minnesota in Iowa City. So back-to-back -back big games for them. And then they finish, uh, then they play Illinois, and then they finish against the Cornhuskers in Lincoln. So they got two tough games coming up. Um, these are going to be two really important games for them if they want to win the West. I already explained what has to happen to Wisconsin if they want to win the West. And it's pretty much the same thing for Iowa. They would have to win out and hope that Minnesota loses um, either to Penn State or to w Wisconsin as well. Um, it's going to be easier for them because if they beat Wisconsin, Wisconsin will already have three uh, conference losses, which will pretty much take them out of consideration for the West. So Minnesota, so they could beat Wisconsin, and Wisconsin could also beat Minnesota, and Iowa would win the West. Um, so... Iowa definitely has a lot of chances here to win the West. They need a little bit of help. Um, they're going to have to win out. It's not going to be easy for them to win out. Um, but the good news is, here's the thing. With the teams they have to play coming up, let's say they do win out. They're going to jump up in the rankings. They are definitely going to jump up in the rankings um, if they make it to the Big Ten Championship game because they will have beaten the number 18. They're right, right now, they're number 19. Wisconsin's 18. So they will have beaten the number eighteen, the number eighteen team on the road. They will have beaten them. They will definitely jump up for that. And then Minnesota right now is thirteen. Who knows what they're going to be when they play Iowa uh, in two weeks? But let's say they beat them, they will jump up in the rankings as well. And then if they win their, their last two games and go to the Big Ten and win their division and go to the Big Ten championship, I think they'll jump up even more. I wouldn't say they're looking at a possible college football playoff. They could be. I'm not exactly sure if they would be able to if they somehow run the table and win the Big Ten Championship. But they definitely have a case to jump up 
um, and make a statement in the rankings if they win their games. And then if they do win their games, they're just going to need a little bit of help um, to make the Big Ten championship game. So, yeah, they're looking good right now. Offensively, they have some stuff to fix. Defensively, they're looking fantastic. We all know that they have one of the better defenses in the country and one of the best ones in the conference. So, uh, good win for them on the road. And uh, we'll see how they do against the Badgers next weekend. That should be a very good game to watch. All right, now we've got Illinois at Purdue. And the score of this game, Illinois 24, Purdue 6. For the Fighting Illini, Brandon Peters got the start. He went 3 of 6 for 26 yards uh, and no touchdowns and no interceptions. Uh, Dre Brown was their leading rusher. He had 18 carries for 131 yards, averaging 7.3 yards a carry, no score. And Donnie Navarro had one reception for 17 yards, no score. Uh, he was their leading receiver. Illinois ran the ball for 242 yards, and they had 268 total yards of offense. Uh, now, Brandon Peters, he did not get hurt or anything early. They just did not throw the ball a lot. They really ran the ball heavily um, on Saturday against the Boilermakers. And for Purdue, uh, Jack Plummer got the start. He went 7 of 19 for 69 yards, no touchdowns, and an interception. And he got benched in the second half. And the guy who came in for him, Aiden O'Connell, came in and almost played just as well. He went 8 of 14 for 67 yards a touchdown, and uh, no interception. So he threw for almost just as many yards, and he was more efficient. He had a better uh, pass completion percentage. He completed more passes and less attempts, and he threw a touchdown and no picks. Um, so he definitely played well when he came in, made the most of his time. And uh, Xander Horvath was their leading uh, rusher. He had nine carries for 54 yards, averaging six yards a carry. No score. And Jackson Anthrop was their leading receiver. He had three receptions for 51 yards, averaging 17 yards a catch. No score. Purdue ran the ball for 135 yards, and they had 271 total yards of offense and two turnovers. I did not see this coming. I thought that Purdue would win this game, even though Illinois was coming off of a big win against Wisconsin, because I thought this would be a hangover game for them. You see it a lot in college football. Um, so I am very shocked that Purdue not only won this, excuse me, that Illinois not only won this game, but they won it by as much as they did. They were on fire throughout basically the entire game. Uh, they had a 17-0 lead going into halftime, and they made the score 24 to nothing at one point. And Purdue scored a garbage touchdown uh, with five minutes left in the fourth quarter to make it 24 to six, and that would be the final score. And Illinois, at the end of October, they have a 500 record at four and four. So, I mean, they, they got four games left. They need to win two more games to be bowl eligible. And I think if they become bowl eligible, Lovey Smith's job is saved there. He he will not be fired because right now he's on the hot seat. Next week they play Rutgers, and with the way uh, Illinois is playing right now, they should be able to win that game to go 5-4 and four and above 500. And then they have to play Michigan State. We will see what happens with that. That could be a tough game. But then they have to play at Iowa, which is going to be very hard. And they finish the season against Northwestern and Northwestern having as bad a season as they are right now. I could see Illinois winning that game. So I could see them beating Rutgers in Illinois, and that'll put them in a bowl game. So, and that's something we haven't seen Illinois in in the last few years. So it'll be very interesting um, to see if they are able to do that. And I think that that will be a major, major accomplishment for Lovey Smith in that program. And it's definitely something they can build off of going into next season. Um, offensively, I thought they would score more points. Defensively, I am shocked with how well they played. They uh, only allowed six points. Basically, They basically shut them out throughout most of the game, and they had a defensive score as well. Um, especially with the way Purdue's offense had been playing the past few weeks, they scored, I think, 40 points against Maryland and then 20 points against Iowa, which is not a lot, but Iowa has a very good defense. So I'm surprised that Illinois, with the way that their defense struggled throughout the first half of the season – the way that they have responded the past two weeks, holding Wisconsin to um, 23 points and holding Purdue uh, to six points. I think that that is just a tremendous job uh, by that defense, and that has definitely resulted in them winning some games. Um, offensively, I think they need to play a little bit better. They played well against how good of a uh, defense Wisconsin has, um, but I thought they would definitely play better against Purdue, given that Purdue does not have the greatest defense. 
Um, they definitely have some holes they need to fix. Um, but we'll see how, how Illinois does. I think that they can win two more games against Rutgers and Northwestern and make a bowl game. We'll see if they if they can do that as well. And I think it'll be uh, very fun to see them in a bowl game because it's something we haven't seen in a while. But uh, good win for them. Um, for Purdue, on the other hand, you know, another tough loss for them. They are now 2-6. and six, And basically, if they want to make a bowl game, they have to win out. And that's not going to happen with the teams that they have to play to finish the year. They have to play Nebraska. They have to play Wisconsin. And they have to play Indiana. And Indiana's looking really good as well, too, right now. So I just really don't see it happening. Just a bad year for them, given all the injuries they've had. And we'll see if they can you know, work hard in the offseason to get healthy and bounce back for next season. Um, but yeah, great win for Illinois. Big win for Illinois. And we'll see how they can finish out the rest of the year. All right, now we've got Liberty at Rutgers. And I know that this doesn't sound like an exciting game with the teams, but this was a pretty exciting game to watch if you watch the highlights for it. Uh, Rutgers won this game 44-34. to This is the first win uh, for Rutgers since they played uh, Massachusetts week one. Um, and for uh, the Scarlet Knights, Johnny Langan uh, got the start again. He went 15 for 21 for only 192 yards, but he did have two touchdown passes and no interceptions. He was also their leading rusher. Um, he had two carries, excuse me, he had 21 carries for 118 yards, uh, averaging 5.6 yards a carry, and a touchdown run. Isaiah Pacheco also had a good day rushing. He had 19 carries for 107 yards, averaging 5.6 yards per carry as well. So they, they actually, they tied. They tied for leading rusher um, on the team. They both had uh, the same average of yards per carry. And Pacheco had two touchdowns uh, for the game. Isaiah Washington was their leading receiver. He had four receptions for 89 yards, averaging 22.3 yards a catch and a touchdown catch. Um, they had 271 rushing yards and 463 total yards of offense. Uh, for Liberty... Stephen Calvert was the quarterback. He went 17 of 31 for 244 yards, a touchdown pass, no interceptions. Joshua Mack was their leading rusher. He had 11 carries for 109 yards, averaging 9.9 .9 yards per carry and two touchdowns. And Kevin Shaw was their leading receiver. He had four receptions for 89 yards, averaging 22.3 yards to catch, no score. Uh, Liberty ran for 131 yards, and they did have 413 total yards of offense, but they did turn the ball over once. And uh, Rutgers won this game 44-34, to and it was, it was pretty back and forth uh, for most of the game. Liberty scored first to make it 7-0. Uh, Rutgers then answered to make it 7-7, and Liberty would answer them to make it 14-7, and that would be the score at the end of the first quarter. Um, and it was just back and forth, back and forth. Rutgers scored to tie it up. Liberty scored to take the lead again, 21-14. And Rutgers would score again to tie it up at 21 with about three minutes left before halftime, and that would be the score at halftime, tied 21 to 21. In the third quarter, uh, Rutgers scored first on their opening drive pretty quickly to make it 28-21, their first lead of the game. And uh, Alex Probert for Liberty would kick, tag on a field goal to make it 28-24. Rutgers would then score again and kick a field goal to go up by 14 points, 38-24, and they would kick one more field goal. Uh, they would kick one more. Yeah, they would kick another field goal to make it forty-one to twenty-four in the fourth. Rutgers would, an, would answer with another field goal of their own to make it forty-one twenty-seven, and uh, Ruck, excuse me, Liberty would kick another field goal to make it forty-one twenty-seven, and then Rutgers would kick another field goal to make it forty-four twenty-seven, and Liberty would score a garbage touchdown with about thirty seconds left to make it forty-four to thirty-four. So it's an, it's not as close um, at the end as it seemed. Uh, with the garbage touchdown, but this game for the most part was pretty back and forth. You know, the only time you really saw Rutgers pull away was kind of at the end of the third quarter, but for the first half and the beginning of the second half, it was just back and forth, and it was exciting. It was drive after drive, you know, the teams would score. And um, for Rutgers fans, they're thinking, oof, 34 points against Liberty, that's quite a bit. And normally I would kind of judge their defense for that, but here's the thing. I mean, Hugh Freeze has a great offensive mind. With Liberty and Liberty is a good football team. They're five and three now. They were five and two going in. 
Um, but I mean, Hugh Freeze, his offensive mind worked when he was at Ole Miss. Um, it worked when he had Bo Wallace and when he had um, Chad Kelly as quarterback, as quarterbacks. And I mean, it, it, it's worked so far this year uh, for Liberty. They've been scoring quite a few points um, in their games. They scored 62 against Hampton and uh, 59 against Maine. So, you know, they're, they're scoring a lot of points. So I'm not going to necessarily bash Rutgers' defense for giving up 34 points to Liberty because um, they, they have a pretty good offense uh, themselves. Um, but as for Rutgers, you know, they finally won a game first time since week one. It's their second win of the season. It's not a conference win, they're, so they're still winless in that aspect. But, you know, I mean, it's uh, the first win under their interim head coach. So we'll see if, you know, they can uh, – have their heads up and gain some confidence heading into next week when they play Illinois. Um, I still think Illinois will win that game, but we'll see what happens. Um, we'll see if Rutgers can carry a win. I know it's not a big win, but you know it's still a win for them, something for them to be positive about and have their heads up high. So we'll see if they can carry that momentum um, into Champaign next week. Uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about that one. A win for Rutgers. They're now 2-6. and six. Um, they're technically still bowl eligible. They would have to win out, but that's not going to happen with, um, what we've seen so far from them in conference play. Um, so yeah, good win for Rutgers. Uh, and we'll see if they respond from it at all, if they could possibly find a way to win another game before the end of the season. All right, next up on the list, we've got Indiana at Nebraska. And the final score of this game, Indiana shockingly beat Nebraska 38 to 31. And for the Hoosier stats, Peyton Ramsey got the start and played the whole game. He went 27 of 40 for 351 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception. Rushing-wise, he had nine carries for 42 yards, averaging 4.7 yards a carry and a touchdown run. Stevie Scott the third was their leading rusher. However, he had 16 carries for 68 yards, averaging 4.3 yards a carry and a touchdown run. And then Watt Fillier was their leading receiver. He had four. He, he had 14 receptions. For 178 yards, averaging 12.7 yards a catch, no scores. And Ty Freifogel had a good day receiving as well. He had four receptions for 75 yards, averaging 18.8 yards a catch and a touchdown catch. Indiana ran the ball for only 104 yards, but they did have 455 total yards of offense and only one turnover. Uh, for the Cornhuskers, Noah Vedrill got the start again with Adrian Martinez out. He was pretty efficient. He went 14 of 16. For 201 yards, uh, no touchdown passes, and no interceptions. Rushing-wise, he did have two rushing touchdowns in the first half. Um, he got hurt for quite a bit of the game, so Luke McCaffrey, who a lot of Huskers fans are excited to see play, um, played for a little bit, and he went 5 of 6 for 71 passing yards, a touchdown pass, and an interception. Rushing-wise, he had 12 carries for 76 yards, averaging 6.3 yards a catch, and no touchdowns. Uh, Wandale Robinson was their leading rusher, however. He had 22 carries for 83 yards, averaging 3.8 yards a carry and a touchdown run. And J.D. Spielman was their leading receiver. He had five receptions for 97 yards, averaging 19.4 yards a catch, no touchdowns. Nebraska had 220 rushing yards, and they did have 514 total yards of offense. So they outran Indiana, and they out-yarded uh, them uh, totally um, by it about fifth by over 50 yards and they but they did turn the ball over twice however and uh, they turned out to be pretty crucial turnovers uh, indiana ended up winning this game 38 31 it was not a pretty start for them nebraska would score first to make it seven nothing indiana would tack on a field goal and then nebraska would score again to make it 14 to three um and this is kind of when people thought okay nebraska is going to take care of business indiana just had an easy schedule they're not as good as people thought um but then they responded. They would score to make it 14-9. Uh, to 9. They missed the extra point. And then they'd score again to take the lead 16-14. to 14. So they scored back-to-back -back, uh, drives. And then uh, Nebraska would answer right before halftime with a touchdown pass to, Kana to Kanawai Noah uh, to take the lead 21-16. to 16, And that would be the score going into halftime. In the second half, uh, Indiana would score and get a two-point conversion to go up by three points. Nebraska tied the game with a field goal, make it 24-all, and then Indiana would uh, score again to make it 31-24, and then after a fumble, they would score again to make it 38-24, to 
Nebraska got back into the game with a Wandell Robinson touchdown run with about 10 minutes left in the fourth to make it 38-31. They would get the ball back, and they would be stopped, and then Indiana ran out the clock, and they pulled the upset 38-31. Now, first thing I want to say, congratulations to the Indiana Hoosiers. They are bowl eligible in October. I don't think anybody saw this coming with back-to-back five and seven seasons. Um, I, I thought they would become bowl eligible. I did not think that they would be bowl eligible this early. Um, and I guess part of that will go in thanks to a somewhat favorable schedule for them. Um, but, I mean, they played well. They played very well against the Huskers. They scored a lot of points offensively. That's something that they've done very well this season. They're averaging a lot of points this season. Um, defensively, they gave up some points to Nebraska, which is an offense that had been struggling over the past three weeks um but i mean nebraska had two weeks to prepare for this game and for indiana to go on the road and win this game is huge uh for them to win back-to-back conference games both on the road is very big especially with the second one putting them in a bowl game um tom allen really has this program going in the right direction right now um and next week they're going to play northwestern so that should be another win for them um, but then they, it's kind of, it's going to be tough for them to end the year. They have to play at Penn state and then they have to play Michigan after that, but then they get to finish with Purdue. Um, so I think that they can win two more games and go eight and four, and that will be a very good season for Indiana, uh, standards considering how they had done the past couple years. So a massive win for the Hoosiers, a very tough loss for the Cornhuskers because this is a game they were favored in, especially, you know, coming off of a blowout loss to Minnesota having two weeks to prepare for this game um, to come out and lose this one is very tough on them. Next week they're going to play at Purdue, and with how poorly Purdue played on Saturday, um, Nebraska could win that game. Um, But, I mean, at the same time, we thought they would beat Indiana, so I'm not sure. Um, They had to play Purdue, and then they have to play Wisconsin after that, and then Maryland, and they finish with Iowa. So two games they should be able to win, and then two games that I really don't see them winning. Um... If they can win those two games, they will be bowl eligible for the first time since 2016. Uh, So we'll see if Scott Frost and that crew can uh, take this team to a bowl game, which will be big for his second year. Um, Albeit, this team is not as good as a lot of people thought it would be. Uh, To start off, you know, favored to win the Big Ten West. They're ranked number 24 in the country in the preseason poll. Uh, This season has been very disappointing for them so far. But I think that if they can finish on a positive note, uh, make a bowl game, and even if they somehow end up upsetting either Wisconsin or Iowa, I think that that will put a positive end on the season. And we'll see if they get to a bowl game, and if they do get to a bowl game, if they can win that bowl game. So we'll see how uh, the season finishes for them. It ended positively for them last year when they won four of their last six, and we'll see if they can do something positive again this year. Uh, So tough loss for them, and a big, big win for Indiana. And we'll see what both of those teams are able to do throughout the last few weeks of the season. All right, now we've got number six, Penn State at Michigan State. And the final score of this one, Penn State won this game 28-7. to And for the Nittany Lions, Sean Clifford went 18 of 32 for 189 yards, four touchdown passes, and an interception. Journey Brown was their leading rusher. He had 12 carries for 45 yards, averaging 3.8 yards a carry, no score. Pat Fryermuth, their tight end, had five receptions for 60 yards, averaging 12 yards, a catch, and three touchdown catches. He was their leading receiver. KJ Handler had a good day as well. He had five receptions for 57 yards, averaging 11.5 yards a catch, and a touchdown. Penn State only ran the ball for 113 yards, and they only had 300 total yards of offense, and they had that one turnover on the interception. For the Spartans, Brian Lewerke, Got the start. He uh, he went 16 of 34 for only 165 yards, no touchdowns and a pick, and he ended up getting benched early in the fourth quarter. Uh, Theo Day and Rocky Lombardi would also play at quarterback after that, but neither of them ended up doing anything. Elijah Collins was their leading rusher. He had 17 carries for 53 yards, averaging just over three yards a carry, no score. And Cody White had three receptions for 66 yards, averaging 22 yards a catch, no scores. Uh, Michigan State had 83 rushing yards, only 265 total yards of offense, and four turnovers. 
Uh, I, I expected Penn State to win this game. I didn't expect it to be a big blowout. Now, obviously, Michigan State is one of those middle-of-the-pack teams, and Penn State is one of the best teams, not only in the Big Ten, but in the country right now. They have looked so good this season, so good. Big step up from being a decent to mediocre team uh, last season. And the way this game went, it, it was pretty much blown open from the start. I mean, I wouldn't say from the start, but Michigan State was never in this game. Um, Penn State scored a touchdown in the first quarter, and then they would score two more in the second to make it 21-0 at halftime. They would end up taking a 28-0 lead in the third, and then Michigan State would answer that last one with a touchdown with seven and a half to go in the third to make it 28-7. to And that would be the final score. Neither team would do anything for the rest of the game. Um, this is another big win for Penn State. Another gutty win for them on the road, which is something that they have done so well, is to play on the road. They have looked really, really good on the road so far this season. With this game, uh, with the game against Maryland, um, where they had a big win against Iowa a few weeks ago on Saturday Night Football. And they've, they're just playing really well. And I think that this game coming up against Ohio State in a few weeks is going to be huge if they beat if they're able to beat Minnesota. And that game will be um, in two weeks from now. Penn State's going to be on a bye next week to prepare for the game against the Gophers, and that should be a very, very good game to watch. And then uh, two weeks after that, they will play at Ohio State, and that should be a fantastic game to watch, assuming that Penn State is still undefeated at that point along with Ohio State. For Michigan State, this one's tough. Um, I don't think anyone really had them winning this game, um, especially because they had won the past two matchups in the past two years, uh, last year being a big upset in uh, State College. Um, but So Penn State, I mean, they had anger on their minds. They had revenge on their minds. And um, I just think that, yeah, Michigan State really never really had a chance for this one. They had two weeks to prepare for this game, but, I mean, their last game they got blown out by Wisconsin, so I didn't really expect them to do that much against the Nittany Lions. Um, they're going to play Illinois next week, and Illinois is kind of on a roll right now, so we'll see um, what's going to happen with that. Then after that game, they're going to play Michigan and Ann Arbor. That's the annual in-state rivalry game. Um, and then they're going to finish with Rutgers and Maryland, which should be two games that they should be able to win. So we'll see what happens with them. I still think that this team is good enough to make a bowl game and um, I'm not sure if this is going to be Mark D'Antonio's final year with the Spartans or not because it's looking like he's going to get ready to leave the program and retire at some point, especially with the past couple seasons being um, pretty down. Ever since they made the playoff in 2015, it's just been down for them. Um, 2016 was an awful season for them. I think they went 3-9, and nine, so not a good way to defend the Big Ten Championship. But um, 2017 was decent for them. Um they didn't finish the season strong, but they had some good wins against Michigan and Penn State that year. Last year, uh, they were supposed to be really good. They weren't. They ended up going 6-6 six and six and lost to Oregon in uh, their bowl game. And then this year has been just very up and down for them. They're 4-4 four and four right now. So we'll see if they can win at least two more games and make a bowl game and uh, what will end up happening with them. But yeah, great win for... Uh, Penn State, they look fantastic right now. Uh, Michigan State struggling a little bit lately. We'll see if they can bounce back um, and end the season on a positive note. All right, now we've got Maryland at number 17, Minnesota, and the Golden Gophers blew out Maryland 52-10. to uh, For Minnesota, Tanner Morgan went 12 for 21 for only 138 yards, two touchdown passes, and an interception. Rodney Smith was once again their leading rusher. He had 17 carries for 103 yards, averaging just over 6 yards a carry and a touchdown run. Chris Hotman bell was their leading receiver. He had 4 receptions for 56 yards, averaging 14 yards a catch exactly, no score. And Rashad Bateman had a good day as well. He had 3 receptions for 39 yards, averaging 13 yards a catch exactly and 1 touchdown catch. Minnesota ran the ball for 321 yards, and they had 498 total yards of offense and that one turnover on the interception. For Maryland, uh, Terrell Pigram started the game at quarterback. He went 6 of 9 for 43 yards, no score, and two interceptions, and he ended up getting benched right before halftime. 
And Tyler DeSue would come in for him. He went 4 of 12 for 88 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions. Javon Leak was their leading uh, rusher. He had seven carries for 44 yards, averaging 6.3 yards a carry, no score. And Tayon Fleet Davis had one reception for 59 yards and a score. He was their leading receiver. Maryland ran the ball for only 79 yards. They only had 210 total yards of offense, and they turned the ball over twice. So they really struggled on Saturday. Um, and my thoughts about this game, man, Minnesota's really playing great. Um, I mean, you have how they blew out Nebraska a couple weeks ago, and then they blew out Rutgers last weekend, and now uh, they blow out Maryland. Now, here's the thing. People can talk about how Minnesota, yeah, they're undefeated, but they haven't played anybody. But here's the thing. Yes, they're winning games, but they're also blowing out who they play. It's not like they're win it's not like at the very beginning of the year when they were winning their games, but they were winning them by like seven points when they were favored by twenty some. No, 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 no. This team is dangerous. This team is really dangerous, and they're making a serious threat to win the West right now. Um, the only teams behind them to possibly win it are Wisconsin and Iowa, but there's a difference between Minnesota from them. Minnesota controls their own destiny. Um, they're gonna have a, a couple tough games coming up. They gotta play Penn State. Um, Iowa and Wisconsin. Luckily for them, two of those games are at home in Minneapolis. Penn State and Wisconsin are both going to be um, at Minnesota, uh, and then they have to play Iowa on the road, and that'll be a gut check for them. And then they play Northwestern on the road right after that, but that should be an easy win for them. This they're going to have two weeks to prepare for Penn State because next week they have a bye. So both teams have buys next week, um, so they both should be. Uh, well prepared for each other and I think that that's going to be a really really fun football game uh, to watch so I'm very excited to see um, what's going to happen for that game um, right now Penn State is ranked number five and Minnesota is ranked 13th um, it's going to be an 11 a.m. game on ABC Penn State is favored by six and a half as of right now but that will change um, we'll see what the spread is and who's favored with it uh, before the game starts, but that's going to be one of the best Big Ten games of the season so far. Not the best, but one of the best ones. I think the best one's going to be Ohio State, Penn State. I think that's going to be a great football team to watch, a great football game to watch, assuming that both teams are still undefeated going into that game. Uh, but yeah, right now Minnesota, boy, they're they're just looking really really good. PJ Fleck, whatever the difference is that he's doing between this year and the past two years. I think it's just because, you know, he's gotten his recruits in. And he's been a decent recruiter so far. Minnesota gets decent recruits. Um, so he's gotten his guys. So he kind of has that bond and that chemistry with his players. And um, they're just playing really well right now. They haven't played anyone tough. But at the same time, they're, pl they're the games that they're playing in, they're playing very well. Even though they're kind of against, I don't want to say nobody's, they're against teams that I wouldn't consider elite but they are blowing them out. So I still consider these, you know, top-notch wins for them. Um, as far as Maryland, uh, they fall to 3-5, and five, um, you know, 1-6 in six in their last – excuse me, I'm sorry, 1-5 in five in their last six games. They have really struggled. At the beginning of the year, a lot of people thought, man, Maryland's going to be a dangerous football team this year uh, with this new coach, and they have just not responded well after that. Uh, we obviously know Syracuse is not the football team that the preseason rankings had them to be. They are not the football team that they were last year. They have severely digressed, and Maryland took advantage of them. And we just saw a bad team beat an even worse team. So, um, yeah, it's, it's tough for Maryland right now because they haven't been winning a lot lately. Next week they play Michigan, and that will be a tough game for them. And we'll see what happens with that. And then they have to play at Ohio State after that. So that's going to be tough. Um, I'm not sure if this team will be able to make a bowl game just because of how they've played the last few weeks. Um, but we'll see what happens with them. Minnesota, I mean, they're, they're looking great. They, I mean, they've already punched their ticket to a bowl game. I think they've already punched their ticket to a decent bowl game. And we'll see if they can punch their ticket to the Big Ten Championship game um, if they win out. Or, I mean, if, if I think that they can afford to lose one game. Um, but I know they don't have their heads on that. And we'll see if this team can jump up in the rankings as well in the next few weeks, especially if they beat 
Penn State, and that'll be their first real test of the season. So we'll see what happens for them. Good win for Minnesota, and uh, we'll see how they end up finishing out the season. All right, and now for the last game on the list, the big Saturday night football game. We got number 8 Notre Dame at number 19 Michigan. Michigan blew out Notre Dame 45-14. to And for the Wolverines, Shea Patterson, he played all right. He went 6 of 12 for only 100 yards, two touchdown passes, and no interceptions. Hassan Haskins was their leading rusher. He had 20 carries for 149 yards, averaging 7.5 yards a carry, no score. And Zach Charbonnet had a great game as well. He had 15 carries for 74 yards, averaging just under 5 yards a carry and two touchdown runs. Uh, Mike Sane was still had three receptions for 73 yards, averaging 24.3 yards a catch and a touchdown. He was their leading receiver. Michigan ran the ball for 303 yards and had 437 total yards of offense. Uh, for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, Ian Book went 8 of 25 for 73 yards. Only uh, one touchdown, no picks, but he did end up getting benched in the fourth quarter. And Phil Jervis, Phil Jerva, Jerkovich, excuse me, uh, came in and he he was uh, producing. He went three of four for sixty yards for a touchdown pass and no interceptions. Jameer Smith was a leading rusher. He had five carries for only fifteen yards, averaging three yards a carry and no score. And Javon McKinley was their leading receiver. He had two receptions for forty-two yards, averaging twenty-one yards a catch and a touchdown catch. Notre Dame ran the ball for only 47 yards, and they had only 180 total yards of offense, and they had two turnovers. Now, the way that this game went, um, it started off kind of slow. Um, Michigan would kick a field goal to go up 3-0 in the first quarter, and that's all that happened in the first quarter. They then scored at the beginning of the second with a Zach Charbonnet touchdown run to make it 10-0, and Charbonnet would punch it in again to make it 17-0, and that would be the score going into halftime. Notre Dame answered at the start of the second half to make it 17-7, but then Michigan scored uh, three straight times. They scored four straight times, excuse me, to make it 45-7 um, in the fourth quarter at one point, and then with three and a half to go, Notre Dame would score once again with a touchdown pass uh, from Jerkovic to Javon McKinley to make it 45-14, so a garbage touchdown. Um, and my thoughts, wow, Michigan dominated. They really played well against the uh, Notre Dame team. This was the second game in a home and home series. Notre Dame won the first one last year, twenty-four to seventeen, week one. Um, but this is good for Michigan. A lot of the Wolverines fans were complaining that he can't beat you know top ten teams. Well, there he just did one. And um, you know another thing they're talking about is how he can't win on the road. It's tough to win on the road in the Big Ten when you're playing good teams. Um, and I know a lot of people are calling for Jim Harbaugh job right now um and i'm gonna give kind of a hot take right now whether he chooses wh whether harbaugh chooses to leave michigan and go back to the nfl is his choice if he wants to go back to the nfl he will be hired as a head coach i know he will be um or if he wants to go to a different college program he'll also get a coaching job there um so whether he chooses to leave michigan is his choice or not um if i'm michigan's athletic department I don't think that they should fire him. I really don't. And I know a lot of people, a lot of fans, and a lot of analysts around the country are saying that it's going to happen because he can't win the East. He can't beat Ohio State. He can't beat top 10 teams on the road. First off, how many times do you see top 10 teams lose at home? I know it, happen it happens here and there. It does. But it's not something that you see often. Um, I mean, look, Harbaugh, the, the Wolverines just destroyed a top 10 team in Notre Dame. They were at home, but they still destroyed them. They beat them by 31 points. And I know I, Notre Dame, uh, because of their schedule, I guess some people won't think that they're as good of a team as a top 10 um, seeding would project them. Um, but, I mean, this is a big win for Michigan. And I think that they're really going in the right direction if they stick with Harbaugh. Because here's the thing, here's the thing. He had a great tenure at Stanford. Then he goes to the 49ers, who were horrible before he got there. He has a fantastic tenure with the San Francisco 49ers. It did not end pretty. I'll give it that. It did not end pretty. But I'm going to say that's more on the organization than it is on Harbaugh. Um, he definitely could have done something better and handled the situation differently. But it was a... He, I think that he 
you know, what he had going in San Francisco was something special. Three straight NFC Championship games in his first three years there. He takes them to a Super Bowl. He loses to his brother. But um, to take a team that had been horrible and in two years take him to the Super Bowl um, is amazing. And that's kind of what he did at Michigan almost. You know, Michigan was horrible before he got there. They were averaging, what, 6-5 wins a season. They were 5-7 and seven in 2014. Harbaugh's first year there, they go 9-3 and three and win, beat Florida in uh, the bowl game. They go 10-3. and three. In 2016, they go 10-2, and two, and they are literally one fourth and one stop from going to the Big Ten Championship game in that Ohio State game. It was fourth and one, and they almost got that stop. They get that stop, they win the East, they go to the Big Ten Championship game, and they play a Wisconsin team that they had already beaten earlier that season. They win that game, they go to the playoff. And in 2016, the Wolverines were co- were consistently in the top five. They started the season off ranked number seven, and they won a couple games to make their way into the top five, and they did not leave the top five until uh, they played in the bowl game against Florida State in the Orange Bowl. And, I mean, and that season did not end pretty, and 2017 was rough. But last year was a good year. They beat good teams at home, and they went 10-2, and two, and I understand they could not beat Ohio State, and they just got outplayed, and they lost to Florida in the bowl game. But here's the thing. Whether, if you still don't think that that's enough for him to keep his job, answer this question. Who do you hire if you're Michigan? I don't know of any, you know, coaches right now who are big coaches who go, who coach at, you know, smaller schools. I could think maybe SMU's coach um, with what they're doing right now. But at the same time, I don't know. You know, what if he wants to stay there? Um I don't think that they're going to hire a guy from the NFL because there are no big NFL coaches that are thinking of leaving um, their jobs right now. And they're not going to hire a guy from a college or NFL team who had just gotten fired because, you know, it, it, if Harbaugh can't live up to Michigan standards, then what makes you think a coach who got fired at a less successful school, you know, if he couldn't live up to a less successful program standards, how do you think that he's going to do well at Michigan? Trust me, I think Jim Harbaugh is the best thing for Michigan right now. Keeping Harbaugh is the best thing for Michigan right now. They are consistently good. I understand they have not been able to beat Ohio State, and I, personally, I don't think they're going to beat them this year. I really don't. I don't think anybody can beat Ohio State this year. I think Ohio State is the best team in the country right now. And I know that if Michigan loses to Ohio State in a few weeks, a lot of people are going to be going after Harbaugh for that. But I still think that he is what you need as coach there. He understands the program. He was a player there, and he won a lot of games there as quarterback. And, I mean, the standards that Michigan has is pretty tough on them. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Michigan, the last time Michigan won a national championship was 1997. And the last time before that was what, in, in, this, in the 60s, maybe? I don't even know about that. The last time... Michigan won a national championship before 1997. It had been a long time. So, you know, I think they really need to lower their standards right now with what, um, you know, with what they have and what they're able to do. Ohio State, yes, you can say he hasn't beaten Ohio State, and that's the thing. That's the game and everything. But here's the thing. Ohio State is one of few teams in the country right now who has consistently dominated their conference. Think about it. Ohio State has dominated the Big Ten the last few years. They've they've dominated the Big Ten the last 10 years or how many? Ever the last almost 20 years ever since they got um, their national championship in 2002. They had won the Big Ten in 2006, 2007, um, 2009, 2000. They almost won it in 2013. They won it in 2014, 2017, and 2018. So they've dominated the Big Ten. 10 over the past how many years and the only two other teams i can think of who have thoroughly dominated their conferences maybe three teams i can think of are alabama clemson and oklahoma alabama has controlled the sec ever since nick saban got there oklahoma has been dominant um ever since 2015 they've won four straight big 12 titles and they're looking to make a fifth run at it this year and then Clemson, ever since 2015 as well. They've been winning the ACC championships back to back to back. So it's those three teams and Ohio State. Ohio State is one of four teams, four teams who have consistently controlled their conference. So to ask 
Jim Harbaugh, who has brought this program back from the dead, in my opinion, to have to beat this team is nearly impossible, especially this year with the way they're playing. I can understand last year when they lost, when they got blown out, because they were ranked higher than Ohio State. But Urban Meyer is a fantastic head coach, and what he did at Ohio State was amazing. So you can't really give Harbaugh grief for not being able to beat him. Very few teams were able to beat him. Um, so I, I just really think that Michigan needs to keep Harbaugh. Because here's my take. Here's, here's basically my summarization. If they fire Harbaugh, they will not get better. They will get worse. So that's my take on that because I know a lot of people are talking about it. A lot of people are back and forth with it because of the win over Notre Dame. Oh, but he lost to Wisconsin on the road. He lost to Penn State on the road. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that they should keep him. And uh, that's all I'm really uh, going to say about that. And that's all I'm really going to say about the Notre Dame-Michigan game. Big win for Michigan. We'll see if they can um, continue to be a contender for the East. We'll see what happens with Penn State and Ohio State. Um and we'll see if Michigan is able to make some noise in that division finishing out the year. Uh, but that does it for the games. Um, one more thing before I sign off. Um, I'm going to go over my subgroups in the Big Ten because uh, I've moved a few teams around. So for the Big Ten Elite, we've got Ohio State, who are 8-0, 5-0 in conference play, Penn State, who's 8-0, 5-0 in conference play, and Minnesota, who is also 8-0, 5-0 in conference play. The three undefeated teams left in the conference are the three teams in the Elite group. And then we've got the contenders, and this is Michigan, who is now 6-2 and two and 3-2 three and two in conference play. Uh, Wisconsin, who is now 6-2 and two and 3-2 three and two in conference play. And Iowa, who is also 6-2 and two and 3-2 three and two in conference play. And that's another thing about Michigan. I understand the one thing about this win that doesn't help them, it's not a conference win. It helps them in the rankings. It does not help them as far as how the Big Ten East goes. Uh, so they're still considered contenders. Uh, for the middle of the pack, I've got Indiana at six and two and three and two in conference play, Nebraska at four and four and two and three in conference play, Michigan State at four and four and two and three in conference play, and Illinois at four and four and two and three in conference play. Illinois is now in the middle of the pack because they have a 500 record and they have played great over the past two weeks. Um, and then the bottom of the conference, the last four teams, we've got Maryland, who are three and five overall, one and four in the Big Ten. Purdue, who's two and six overall, one and four in the Big Ten. Rutgers, who is two and six and zero oh and five in the Big Ten, and then Northwestern, who is probably going to be ranked last at the end of the year. They are one and six right now and zero oh and five in the Big Ten. So that's where I've got uh, the groups, and it, I, I'm sure that some of these teams may change in the couple weeks, and we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, that's all I've got to say about this one. Let me know what you guys think. Um, about this video in the comment section. Uh, what do you think about the games that I talked about? What do you think about the teams I talked about? What do you think about the games coming up in the next few weeks or even next week even? Um, and also, what do you think about Jim Harbaugh? And we could do a separate video on Jim Harbaugh and what's going on with him. Um, but yeah, let me know what you guys think about his position right now at Michigan and what you think is going to happen to him. Um, but yeah, I thank you all so much for watching. If you could please leave a like on this video, that would be much appreciated and subscribe to our channel as well. Subscribe to our main SG1 sports channel as well. I thank you all so much for watching and I hope you all have a great day.